Check, check, one, two, one, two. Can you hear me back there? Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. Awesome. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for your love for us. Um, Father, we pray, I pray for more of you. I pray for more of you for not only for me, but for everyone who's seated here today, who's listening here today, who's listening on our live stream, people who are listening after the live stream is already posted and they're driving their cars or something. For whoever is hearing these words this morning, I pray for more of God. I pray for a healing and a strengthening to their union with God. I pray that they would be enabled and strengthened to release everyone and everything to you, Lord. Help us in this season of change and division and fear and concern and anxieties, to stay close to Jesus. Bless this time that we have together today in the Word, and allow it to be fruitful and effective. Your Word says that it never returns to you void. May it be so, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, when I started uh, my journey towards becoming a pastor, uh, I went to visit a school um, in Jackman, Maine, and what a visit it was. It was crazy. I got stranded there for an extra day, just left behind. It was awesome. But after that, I, um, I was talking to my mom, and she said, hey, no, like, you know, I know you've been stressing out a lot about, about where you want to go to school, and I know you don't really want to stay in New Brunswick, which I didn't, uh, but she was like, why don't you just, why don't you try Kingswood? Like, it's, it's literally an hour away from you. Why don't you just give it a shot? See if that's where God might be leading you. And I'm like, all right, well, fine, Mom. <laughs> I'm not going to go to Kingswood. Anyway, so I went to Kingswood. And um, I went there for uh, three and a half years. I lived, I lived in Sussex. And then for the last you know, few months, I, I moved to Nova Scotia and started my job there as a youth and family pastor. Um, that was, there was a lot of changes that happened in my life during that time. I got engaged the summer before I started at Kingswood to Brittany. Um, not somebody else, that'd be awkward. Uh, but no, Brittany and I got engaged uh, in June of 2014, shortly after graduating from high school, actually, for me. <laughs> um, and then after that, uh, I started at Kingswood in September. And due to like, a series of events, some of which were not my fault, most of which were my fault. Um, <laughs> lots of mistakes and failures and you know, tripping up and giving in to temptations that I knew that I wasn't supposed to, and um, I, I failed. And so there's all this, not only was there this big thing of change, but there's also this big, just this big list of mistakes that I made coming into Kingswood in 2014. So I started my school year, and I was completely disrupted. I had this very strict, rigid structure for reading the Word of God, for spending time in prayer, um, and even like, you know, different things that I would do th throughout the day to remain close to the Lord. I even drank water a lot more than I do today, and I exercised, I was a very healthy person. And then coming into Kingswood, everything shifted. I became a hot mess. It was awful. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know how to stay surrendered 
to Jesus in the midst of that change. I'd never gone through such a large overhaul in my life before. And so shifting from, you know, living my life at my parents' house, most everything done for me, starting at Bible college, I was like, it was like on my own, in the deep end. Good luck, see how you do. And then there was another big change. You got married the following May. That was a really big change. Because not only did I move out of dorm at Kingswood, I also moved completely out of my parents' house and moved into a basement in Sussex. When I say basement, I don't mean like a basement apartment. It's just a basement. <laughs> and so we moved into a basement for our first place to live. Um, and then, and so that was a big thing to change. And whatever adjustments that I made to get back to some level of consistency during my first year at Kingswood was thrown right out the window when I got married because everything was different. And I didn't know how to stay surrendered to Jesus in the midst of all the changes that I was going through. Then I started a new job all together. I started working um, as a student pastor at Norton United Baptist Church. It was one of, it was some of the best years of my life. I'm not even kidding. But then I went from there to starting at a job four and a half, no, five and a half hours away from anybody that I had a close relationship with, with my wife. And we bought a house, and there was all these, all these changes, 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 changes. And I was, once again, disrupted. I didn't know how to stay surrendered in the midst of all the changes I was going through. And I wanted to stay surrendered to Jesus. It wasn't that I wanted to give up on doing my devotions every day or exercising or, or eating well or spending proper time with my wife or even working at my best at my job. I, it wasn't that I didn't want to succeed. I did. I did want to be surrendered, but I, I, I messed up. And then Brittany gives birth to a baby. That changes everything. That baby is awesome, and she doesn't do so well after that. She gets really sick. And so uh, coming out of that, that huge trauma, that was a big set of changes. Then I started here, another big set of changes. And now I just moved into a new house, yet another big set of changes. And, and just like me, I'm sure you can point back to certain moments in your life in which you went through what Fred Rogers called a modulation. A huge change, whether it was something in yourself, with your development, or with your family life, maybe you had a new child, or maybe you're retired, or whatever large life change happened. You can point back to those moments, and you can see how that change went really well, and how that change, you know, maybe could have gone differently. What do we do when life changes? How do we know God's will when things are changing all around us? How can we pursue God's kingdom and his righteousness when we're thrown completely out of sorts by our circumstances? Individually, I mean, these changes lead to stress and exhaustion. And even as churches, I mean, a lot of churches have gone through a lot of changes. Am I right? A lot of changes. I mean, it's only just recently that we got all these chairs back in here. And it is weird, let me tell you. It's weird to see all these, cha all these chairs. But as a church, we've gone through a lot of changes, too. New people have come. Some people have, have transitioned to somewhere else. Some people have moved across provinces. There's all kinds of changes. And there's, there's something that happens, especially with the kinds of changes that happened during COVID-19, where there's strain put on relationships where strain was not previously placed. There's confusion about what we're doing or where we're going or... There's, there's, a, there's a lack of connectedness. Are we still, hey, are we all still good? Are we still buds, you know? Are we, are we you know, do, do we still love each other? <laughs> and that sounds almost silly, the fact that we even ask that, but it's true. I mean, changes and circumstances, they throw us into a loop. I remember even going through marriage counseling before I got married, pre, pre-marital counseling. And um, the guy that was leading it, he said, you know, my wife and I, we've, had, we've been married for 30 plus years, and we, we do really well, but when we move, we go through a move, whether it's to an apartment, to a house, to a new place, whatever it is, it is stressful. You might have, you might have thought that we, we were you know, an old married couple bickering back and forth or something. It was, it's crazy. We, we don't treat each other very well. And then, but, 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 but changes as a group cause strain and confusion. And so the solution ought to be clear. Because the question is simple. How do we stay surrendered when things are changing? That's a simple question. And I think there's a simple answer, but it's not an easy answer. The easy answer is that we must choose, in the midst of all the changes, to submit to God. To surrender 
to give up all of the anxieties to Jesus, to, to, to give our will to God. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how we can do that. Peter, you know, all, y'all know Peter, y'all also known as Cephas or Simon, son of John. What an awesome, super chill guy. Just kidding. He was a super intense, awesome guy. Um, but with all of that passion, he also had a, a, a depth of commitment and intimacy with Jesus and towards Jesus that, that lasted all the way up until the last day of his life, where he gave, him, gave up his life as a martyr. And, and Peter encouraged a persecuted church. They were going through all kinds of changes, just like we are going through all kinds of changes. Now, those changes might not be the same kind. But there is all kinds of things going on in their lives on the government level, on the personal level, even on the church level that that challenged them and put them in a position in which they would be easily discouraged and distracted from their commitment to Christ. So we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. If you want to uh, just read along with me first, and then we'll kind of go in a little deeper. That's awesome. So if you have your Bible with me, uh, with you this morning, if you want to turn to to 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 6. We're going to go to verse 11. Um, we're not going to flip through the slides. We're just going to read it. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. Just close your eyes and listen to it. Just give, it, give this, these words your full attention as best you can. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast. Ooh, cast. Whoa. <laughs> Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen? Amen. I love a good amen. Peter starts out in this little discourse in the midst of his letter. Um, and keep in mind, this is near the end. So this is like his, one of his last words to his friends who are part of a persecuted body of believers. He knows these people decently well. There's people that they actually have mutual relationship with. He talks later about you know, the, the, the different characters from the book of Acts that we would all recognize. And so he has a relationship with his church, and he starts... Uh, this, this part, uh, this is in the middle of him saying, you know, clothe yourselves with compassion, humility, with gentleness, with patience, with respect. You know, treat others with humility because God opposes the proud, but he lifts up the humble. So he's, 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 he is rounding down. He is landing the plane on a letter to his friends today. And what he says is, how humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. And it's interesting, um, there, are, there are a lot of people that I've known who are A-type personalities, or people who are, who are specifically very gifted in terms of, of, of accomplishing administrative tasks, you might say. And those people help the world go around. I mean, if, without those people, you know, the ice cream melts, the planes fall apart, it's a bad thing. You know, it's good to have people who are able to, to keep the details running smoothly. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, there was there was once a time in my life where I identified as a person like that, where I wanted to be extra productive and wanted to be self-sufficient, wanted to do things really, really well and make things happen. Um, but Peter actually challenges not those people just specifically, but anybody who is in a situation in which they're anxious or going through, who, going through troubles or going through persecutions to actually humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. The only way that we actually find peace or strength or confidence when life changes is by acknowledging before God that he is God and we are not. That is a big challenge for a lot of the the worldlier thinkers in our day. A lot of the worldly thinking comes from, okay, if if anything's going to make it happen, you're going to make it happen. There's even Disney songs about it. 
Um, you gotta make it happen, it all depends on you. So I work real hard each and every day, and things are sure to be going my way. Just doing what I do, look out boys, I'm coming through. But there's this perspective that's like, I'm gonna be the one to make it happen. My hard work is gonna make it pay off. Everything that I do, I'm gonna make sure that it's under control. But when we, as a Christian, accept the call that Jesus provides us to be a disciple, what we do is we forfeit our right to assert that we are in control. We forfeit our right to assert that we are in control. It is impossible for us to control our circumstances. Just yesterday, Brittany and I went on a visit to see two of the boys that we're adopting. Um, and <laughs> we have been late every single time for every, every single of every one of these visits. Not because we don't want to see the boys. Um, yesterday in particular, Luca, I, we, I just got him into his outfit, got a sweater on him, everything was good. He puked all over. I'm like, okay, well, it's just on the surface. At least it's not going to touch his skin. That's fine. Then he pukes on the other sweater. Then he pukes on the blanket too. I'm like, listen, man, come on. Anyway, so I, I switch him into a new sweater that kind of looks like you know, he's a hobbit, like one of these like knitted sweaters with the pointy hood. And so I'm like, whatever, man, you look like you're out of some sort of fantasy <laughs> novel, but let's get out the door. So we get him in his seat and then, and Levi's being a little bit more difficult than usual. And then things just aren't lining up. It's just like everything, we were on time and now everything's out of control. Keep in mind that we're also driving over an hour through construction outside of not only a river view, but also every other spot on the way to Sussex to see these two boys of ours. And we desperately want to see them. So we're just like, ah, you know what, we're late, but we don't want to give up. So we are on our way and we make it. And the lady tells me, she's like, I have never been late for anything in my life. I just can't wrap my head around somebody like you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay. well, sorry about that. It's all my fault. Because I mean, like, I, I took responsibility. You know, like, being late is not necessarily a good thing. Even if something happens outside of your control, especially if it happens every single time. <laughs> but in that moment, as I was walking out the door, I was like, God, like, did I really blow it here? Did I just really just let you down? And I really got this sense of encouragement and said, no, you can't control everything that happens on your way through life. You can't. Um, you can try and do better. Like, there's things to learn from and to grow from and to, and to be more disciplined, and that's a great thing. But, but, but Peter encouraged his friends, no matter who you are or what goes on in your life, what level of giftedness you might have in organizational details, all of us must humble ourselves and refuse to, to, to assert control over anything that is absolutely not under our control. There's the serenity prayer, right, that says, God, give me, give me the, the strength to, to change the things that I can change and the, the patience to, how does it go? Yeah, accept the things that I cannot change, yes, and give me the courage to change the things that I can and so there's, there's this, this, this sense of peace that comes from humbling ourselves under God's mighty hand, trusting that he's the only one who is in control of our circumstances on any given moment. And keep in mind, it's God's mighty hand. This is the, God's, this is the mighty hand that parted the Red Sea. This is the mighty hand that drove out the nations out of Israel so that they could inherit the promised land. This is the mighty hand who accomplished restoration for the people of Israel, the rebuilding of the temple, the reestablishment of Israel as a nation. Not once, not twice, but many times throughout world history. And even now, in, 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 in the 20th century, we had Israel being restored to being a nation of sorts. And so we have God mighty hand moving amongst his people over and over and over again. This is the mighty hand of God. He can do anything. Nothing is impossible for him. So not only are we giving our lives over to someone who we are asserting that we can't control, we're also giving control up to the only person who can not only do what we ask for, but can do immeasurably greater than anything we could possibly ask for or even imagine in our head. God's imagination is greater than yours. And his power to accomplish anything is greater than anything we could ever ask for. And so this is the God we're humbling ourselves before. And he will, this is a promise, right? He, he will lift you up in due time. Due time is the tricky part, isn't it? <laughs> no, uh, don't worry. You will sell your house in due time. Only about two years, you know. Just give, just give it time. Just be patient. In due time. You will have more children in due time. You will have the restoration of 
of your life in due time. And whether that due time happens in this life or if it happens in the age to come, God's promise is sure. If we humble ourselves under his mighty hand, we are able to trust that he will lift us up in due time. And this is one of the most famous passages. I love this passage so much, and it's encouraged me over and over and over again throughout my life. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. And so we get to this part in the passage where we're like, wow, this is super encouraging. Thanks a lot, Peter. So glad that you said this to us. Because in this passage, um, we have an encouragement in the midst of the changes that really stress us out. Not just the changes that we are okay with. There are lots of changes that I'm okay with in life. And in fact, I'm, I'm quite okay with, say, the Riverview Causeway being finished. You know, I'm totally okay with that change. That'd be a refreshing change of pace, that, that, in fact. Um, but there's other changes that really stress us out. And there's other things that, that even if they don't necessarily change for the better or for the worse, that they just stay in this sustained pattern of stressful. We can cast these upon God as well because he cares about us. We can take every piece of our life and give it to him. So I have a piece of paper here. It is a whole piece of paper. Bob, can you assert that this is a whole piece of paper? Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Here's the thing. This piece of paper is great, but it represents your life. You started out naked and afraid in a hospital room, probably. Maybe you were born in your living room. Who knows? And once upon a time, you were born, and you started out um, already having problems. So there's a few already to start with. You know, you're born into sin. You're completely hopeless without God. You need to depend on other people who aren't always reliable to eat to have your diaper changed, to sleep properly, all of that stuff, for safety, all that stuff. So there's things that, that are just, that take you apart. All these different pieces that are a part of your life. Then you have more stuff. You grow up, you get older, you get a career, you get a family, you get kids. How many of you have adult children? How many of you still think about your adult children just as much, or if not more, than when they were babies? Yeah. <laughs> It's like it's one thing when you're holding them in your arm. It's another thing when they're out in the world gallivanting about doing God knows what. <laughs> and so you have your kids. Maybe you have two kids. Maybe you have four, like me. Okay, cool. You know? So there's things, there's part of things part of your life. You're, you're, you're not a whole complete set, right? And then there's more that, that comes. There's COVID-19. That's a pretty big chunk. There's your finances. Your debt, I have over, I have a lot of student debt, so I, I, that's a piece of me too. And you have your credit card, so you have the fact you lost your keys the other day and you still don't know where they are. <laughs> or you have, you have a dog and your dog is doing things that your dog should not do. Or whatever it is, you have all these pieces in your life. And the word anxiety in the Greek is marimma, which is pieces, literally. The actual literal denotation of this word anxiety in the Greek is pieces. Things that were whole and now are apart. And so the, the connotation, the meaning that is conveyed through the Greek word anxiety at the, at, for the contemporaries of the time was things that, that rip you apart. Things that, that divide your attention. Things that capture your attention. The little tiny pieces of your life. Everything from the, how often you brush your teeth and, or, or the dentist appointment you have next week, or your marriage, or anything. All these pieces represent your life. And all these pieces are spread out on the floor. And I'm sure I could probably bundle up enough that I could pass them on to Bob. And maybe I'd even make contact with a couple of them. But the word cast there is really just to throw it. Right? Like, <laughs> oh, okay, that was effective. All right. <laughs> okay, cool. That's casting. You, you, you cast it. Right? When, they, when they went to cast lots at Jesus, at Jesus' cross, they cast lots and they threw it. And so to take your anxiety and cast it on the Lord is to literally take the things that are dividing your attention, the things that are causing you concern, care, worry, and fear, and actually give it to the Lord. And the fact is, there's a lot of them to deal with. I mean, that's only a, these, these can only represent really a portion of your life. And there are depths of you that I would never be able to know the way that God knows. But he says that he actually genuinely cares for you. So anxieties represent the things that we have an interest in, in whatever way, whether negatively or positively, 
that, that divide our attention. But the word cares literally means he's concerned over you. He has an interest in your life. He has a, de he has a, de uh, a decided purpose for your life. He, has, he literally cares about you. When you think about your kids, you might not be able to assert control over their lives, not as you'd like to at times. But no matter what might be happening in their lives, you know that you care for them. Amen? And I don't know, I, I'm, I'm assuming with a great deal of confidence that I will also care for my kids in much the same way. Even as, I mean, like I have half my family with me and half somewhere, other, somewhere else. And so there's, that's a concern there. I, I pray about that. And God thinks and cares about you in much a greater way that you think about your kids or you, you're concerned about your finances or whatever. God has you on the list of things that he is concerned with. When I say concern, I don't necessarily mean that he's up there frantically thinking, oh my goodness, how are we going to take care of Bob? He's a mess! You know, he's not thinking that way. What he is thinking is that he desperately, deeply cares about what happens to you. He cares about all of these little details, every single one of them, because all means all, right? Mm -hmm. So if God is saying, cast all your anxiety on me, he's saying, hey, take the patient work of taking everything and releasing it all to me. Put it all on the table. And it's going to take you some time because there's a lot of things spread all over the place. So you're going to have to think and really get to this place of, 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 of a heart connection with God and say, God, I give you my kids. And I give you my fears. And I give you my childhood wounds. And I give you my marriage. And I give you my finance. I give you all this stuff. I give it to you. I cast it on you. I can't handle it. I humble myself before you. I can't control this stuff. The next thing that Peter says is being, be sober-minded and alert. The difference between so alert and of sober mind is frantic and not clear-headed. So, like, obviously there's, you know, the difference between drunkenness and so sobriety, right, is you have your, your wits about you. But of alertness has to do with being awake, but also being at peace, which is interesting. It has to do, it has to do with not allowing our anxieties to determine how we approach our life, which is a challenge, isn't it? Because the first verse, right, where he says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand, he's going to lift you up, but you have to give all your anxieties to him because he cares about you. And so when you do that, there is an area in which I'm taking all the stuff that's bumbling around in my head and I'm taking that anxiety and that divided attention and I'm giving that to God. And by doing that, I'm actually surrendering to him that space in my mind. Whatever this particular concern, worry, fear, anxiety might be taking up space in my head and in my attention, when I cast it upon the Lord, there is a space there that Jesus now gets to fill instead of that. And that's what he wants. Because if Jesus is able to occupy the places of your mind, you will have life and peace. Romans chapter 8, right? It says, the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. And so every time we take an anxiety off of the throne of our mind and we place Jesus there instead, we have alertness and sobriety of mind. Which means we are at peace in our mind. And we're able to make good decisions. We're able to think clearly about things. To think about things as they are, not as we would prefer them to be, and not as they are compared to somebody else's set of circumstances. Am I making sense so far? We're tracking? The next verse is very important, and I don't want to diminish this. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Other translations say seeking someone to devour. Seeking someone to devour. The enemy wants you to keep this stuff in the recesses of your mind. He wants you to keep this stuff distracting you, discouraging you, keeping you down. He wants to keep using this stuff, throwing your mistakes in your face, throwing your guilt, your shame, your worries in your face to keep you from doing what God has called you to do. The enemy's desire is to discourage you and to devour you. 
And there's so many ways that he wants to do that. He wants to deceive you. He wants to distract you. He wants to put anything else on the throne of your mind before Jesus. Because if he can get you into this place where you are constantly consumed with the circumstances of your life, which, by the way, we all know we can't control, then he can assert dominance over that recess of your mind. He can discourage you with those things. He can throw a thought your way. He can throw a lie your way. He can throw a feeling your way. And I'm not saying that the devil is not defeated. He is a defeated enemy, but he is sentenced. And he is going to take down as many people as he can with him on the way. Jesus said, or the, the word of God says that his time is short, his, but his fury is great because his time is short. And so he's, he's roaming the earth backwards and forwards, east and west, north and south, just to look for people like you and me who know Jesus in order that he might obsessively discourage you and distract you to the end that you may be devoured. He wants to take out your heart. He wants to take out your influence. He sees what God can do with your lives, with our church, with the church as a whole globally, and he wants to destroy it. He wants to prevent the church from living the life we're called to live. The only way that we live the life that God has called us to live is by submitting our will and our anxieties to Jesus, having a sober and alert mind, being aware when the devil tries to strike at us, because his, his desire is to discourage you so that he may devour you. And so the Bible says resist him. Resist is an active word. It's not a passive word. And he's not saying, like, you know, put your defenses up. He's not saying, make sure that shield's up high. You know what I'm saying? He's a resist him. Fight back against the devil, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. There's all kinds of difficulties and distractions and discouragements that are coming up against us as God's people. But we are not alone in that struggle. One of the ways that the enemy has gotten at me, and maybe he's gotten at you too, is by putting you into a situation in which he can give you a perception that you are isolated. And in fact, he will put you in a situation in which you are isolated, or try to put you in that situation. Jesus says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. One of the ways that we can fall into temptation is by isolating. He wants to get you alone. He wants to get you scared. He wants to get you discouraged so that he can come in and carve out your heart. Because he wants to communicate to you that you're on your own. You can't do this. And by the way, everything is on you. All the pressure, all the work, all the anxieties, they're all your responsibility. And you're a mess up, man. You're a failure. And there's nobody around that can help you. The devil's narrative in your life is going to pinpoint those areas in which only God can provide for you. He wants to go at these areas and say, you're the one that has to hold everything together and you are not doing it. But... Uh, Ray Johnston, who is uh, good gracious, let me go. Who is an author? He wrote the book Hope Quotient, and he said discouragement is the anesthetic the devil uses on a person just before he reaches in and carves out his heart. He wants to put you in a position in which you are discouraged. Like if you give up hope, you have lost the fight. If you give up hope, you have lost the fight. When I first came to Salisbury, there are many people that I met, and especially students who, have been give, who had given into despair. And one of the best gifts that we as the church can give to those who have given into despair is the hope of the gospel. The gospel is the only hope for any of us who live on this planet today. And the discouragement that the devil wants to say is that, you know what, the gospel is not powerful, it is not effective, it will not lead you to, the, to God's best life for you, it's, he's, you're not doing it right, you're messing up, it's all on you, make sure you self-centered, get self-centered because you got to work on yourself so you can work harder. And you get to this place of discouragement to the point where he'll sweep the rug out from under you and finally... Whatever influence and power you might have had in your life, the devil wants to come in and wants to destroy you. But the Bible tells us that if we surrender, then we live the life that God intended for us. If we give up our life for the sake of Christ and the gospel, then, then we'll save it. Then we'll preserve it. Then we'll have the life that God actually wants for us. 
the encouragement that Peter gives to his friends is that number one, yeah, your devil is against you. The devil is against you. The devil, the devil is your enemy, the enemy of your soul. He's an accuser. He's a deceiver. However, you have the power to resist him because of the faith on which you stand. Because of, of who you have put your trust in. Because the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. And the more that you can constantly win the battle, not the constantly obsessing over of spiritual warfare, but rather constantly winning the battle of spiritual warfare by surrendering your will and your desires and your preferences and your comparative you know, feelings of, of lack. If you, if you constantly give your life in the place of your mind in which your attention is divided to Jesus... You win. That's what the enemy's at. He's after your heart. He's after your, the, 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 the seat of your will, your passion, and, and the, where, the place where you make commitments. He wants to get at you and discourage you, and he wants to carve up your heart. And the way to win is by surrendering. And then Peter starts to, to really land a plane. Not only of this, but of his whole letter. And he says, And the God of all grace, who called you, to his eternal glory in Christ. After you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. Mm, hallelujah. Come on. That's awesome. The God of all grace. Notice the word grace rather than any other word. God is God of all hope. He's the God of all peace. He's, you know, well, he could have used anything. He said the God of all grace. Grace says, you know what? You can't do it, but I love you anyway. No, you can't save yourself. No, you can't rescue yourself from sin. No, you can't adequately live life the way that, to, the, to its fullest on your own. No, you can't. But because of my grace, I'm sufficient. I'm enough. I'm going to take care of you. Don't you worry about a thing. God says that you are well. And you will be well because of his grace. If the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. The word called is similar to that word that Jesus that, that was used of Jesus in John chapter 11. Where Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come out! It's like when Levi just doesn't want to get out of the house. I'm like, come on! But... but but he says, but he called to Lazarus. He called to the dead man, and he called him out. And Jesus calls you. He has called us to his eternal glory in Christ. He's called us out of death. He's called us out of discouragement to the realm in which we all say together with him, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting after all of this? Nowhere, because of what God has done you have been called to his eternal glory in Christ. You have been given a purpose. You have been set free. You have been given power to live the godly life that God has called you to live because of Jesus. Because of your faith and your position in Christ. There is nothing that can separate you from his love. Because the God of all grace, through Jesus, has brought you to a better land. To a better hope. To a better promise. And he's acknowledged your suffering. He knows that you're hurting. He knows that your heart is broken and breaking. He knows that your, your attention is, is pulled apart by all the things of life. He knows that the cares and anxieties of life, they're, they matter. He knows you. He cares about you. He has given his life up so that you may be with him. And he knows that the suffering you're enduring today, it matters. But it is a suffering that lasts a little while when you look at the big picture. Lately, I've been sensing that God is calling me to look at things as from a bigger picture. There's this temptation. I think it, partly it's, it's youth, being young. But I think partly it's also living in a culture um, that, that, that kind of tends this way. And feeling there's a sense, not not... Not a direct sense of invincibility or something, but this weird sense that I think that I'm going to go on to live a very long life. And you're like, what is he talking about? What I'm saying is that something in me 
The way that I function and approach life is that, okay, I'm going to set up these goals. I'm going to think five years in advance, ten years in advance. I'm going to think, you know, when I started this new job, what do I want to see in three years' time? What do I want to see in ten years? Where do I want to be when I'm 48? What's my life going to be like then? But God says, uh, focus on your faithfulness to him in the here and now. Not that you should obsess over the present moment, but that you should be present to the present moment. The enemy actually uses that, that tendency in us to think to the next summer, to think to the next decade. Because he wants to, you to stay distracted, not on the things that are happening and not on the ways and the realities in which God is working today. He wants you to be thinking so far in advance that you're completely distracted from your call today. When the call today is to surrender today, as long as it's called today, surrender. Live the life that God has called you to live. Don't overly obsess about the future because you do not have the future guaranteed to you. Amen? So if there's anything that car accidents, living in a hospital for a month, or getting run over by a car when I was in my childhood, yep, that happened, has taught me is that life is not as solid as it presents itself. It is immensely fragile. It can end today. And I'm not saying that to be morbid. I'm saying that to say, okay, take this seriously. You know what? COVID will come and it will go. Because everything has. Everything. You know what they thought the bubonic plague was going to be? The end. <laughs> I remember when, when COVID first happened in 2020, a friend of mine was talking to me about how people at his work were asking him, the only Christian at his, at his place of employment, if this was the end. Was Jesus going to come back? That was in 2020. Life is fragile. And those things may come and they may go, but today, you, you have today. You have today to surrender. You don't have tomorrow to surrender. So tomorrow's not even in your hands. It might be one of the things that are occupying your attention, but you don't have it. It's not real. You don't have that. You have this here and now. And your concern is not to be concerned about the future. Jesus says, do not be worried about tomorrow. Now, keep in mind, I'm also saying that planning for today, the planning for tomorrow is today's responsibility. So I'm not saying defer tomorrow's responsibilities, but I am saying don't give it your chief attention. Your chief attention should be being faithful to Jesus in every moment-by-moment -moment act of obedience. Your concern is to be with your Lord and loving him now. And if you know that there's a state in your life or there's a concern in your life that's getting more attention than Jesus, then that's an issue that must be dealt with today, not tomorrow. You want to live the life that God has called you to today. Don't let it wait. Don't waste your time. You have very precious little of it. Focus instead on being obedient to Jesus. As Jesus said, it would be better for the master to find his servant doing what he called him to when he returns. Amen? So, but this is one of the most encouraging parts of this. He will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Something within us wants to be established and immovable. Unable to be affected by the circumstances that come our way. We want to be invincible. We want to be undestroyable, undefeatable. And God is like, yeah, I put that desire in you to give you that sense of longing to the day where I will myself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. He is going to personally restore you. How many of you have ever um, ordered something online and it never came? Anybody? Maybe you were expecting mail and it never showed up. Maybe you were expecting a government check once upon a time. Maybe you're a GST check or something. And it just never showed up. Anybody? Every once in a while, things will be promised to me and it won't come through. But God is saying whatever it is, whatever area of suffering or attention that has been that has been hurting you or, or causing you pain or causing you discouragement, I'm going to make it personal. I will personally get down and restore you. I will personally make it happen. I will personally establish you. I will personally make you restored, strong, firm, and steadfast. That he himself will put a crown of righteousness on our heads. That he himself will make it happen. That he's not going to send some delegate to do it. 
He's not going to be like, ugh, I think Peter's available. So let's send him, whatever. He's not like that. He's going to do it himself. He's going to make it personal. His intention is to restore you. And finally, he closes it by saying, to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And the power, it's funny that he uses the word, the power. Because with all this time, we've been talking about what, who has the power? Who has the power? And you're like, what? We haven't been talking about that. Actually, we have. Surrender is about who has the power in your life. If I have the power, then I'm surrendered to no one but myself. I'm the boss. I'm in charge. And if God has the power, then he's the one that I bring my anxieties to. He's the one I bring my decisions to. He's the one I inquire of when things get confusing. If he's got the power in my life, then he's the one that I'm taking direct orders from. He's the one I'm taking my cues from. He's the one that's encouraging me. He's the one that I'm hoping in. He's the one. And it's to him who belongs to power forever and ever. It's him that belongs the control of my life, the governance of my mind, the life and peace that I so desperately need and desire. So, we're going to land this plane. Amen? Let's do it. They're like, come on, wrap it up. When things change, surrender in hope. When things change, surrender in hope. Surrender is completely nonsensical if there is no hope. Surrender is completely... Taking medications that have no results are nonsensical. Amen? You wouldn't go to the store and get a, a me prescription medication that has all these ho awful, horrible side effects that had no results. Amen? You are taking a step of surrender towards the Lord in hope that what he has said is true. And his hope doesn't put you to shame. But what I'm calling us all to, whether it's on the individual level or even on the church level, if there's a change that is coming or a change that is happening on the ongoing, that we must surrender and hope. We must believe the best is not just possible, but that the best is yet to come. We have to believe that. If we give in to despair, we have lost. And it's a fight that we can't afford to lose. Ray Johnson in his book said, Adequate resources don't change the world. People with hearts strengthened by hope change the world. If we want to make a change in the world, not just a change in the general sense, not just by planting a community garden or whatever it is. If we want to make a genuine impact in the lives of those around us, if we want to genuinely be faithful to the Lord and loving him and loving our neighbor with feeling, you know, with, 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 uh, with a, a faith that bears fruit, and we do so with our hearts strengthened by hope. The change that God wants to bring in your life can only come by you choosing to change. The prayer in the midst of change is change me. Sometimes we pray, God, fix this stuff. Fix this thing. Change this situation. Hit, fix my kids, man. There's something else. Change this. But what God wants us to do in hands lifted in surrender is change me. Change me. Use this change for good. Use this change to mature me, to grow me. Commit to your maturity in Christ. By whatever circumstance might be brought your way, realizing that God is still in control, He's still on the throne, I still have a hope, my hope in Him alone. And if that's the case, then God change me. If, anybody, if you're going to have the power... Have the power in me. Change me. And then the following prayer is change us. We want to be different as a result of God's work and transformation in our life. Transformation means nothing if there's no change. Us as a church, we need God to, to change us. If there's areas in our life where our attention is in the wrong places, in our programs, in our attention of, with our ministries, and our service to the community, if there's something that is out, off kilter or not aligned with the will of God, God change us. Amen. If there's changes that are causing us anxiety, fear, if there's changes that's happening, and we are Baptists in this room, amen, 
Change is not something we prefer, but when change comes, it's there. And there ain't nothing you can do about it except let it be fruitful. Don't let any change go to waste. Change us, Lord. Change us. So what I want you to do to apply this stuff this week, to apply this stuff, is practice the discipline of submission. And you're like, what do you mean? The discipline of submission is to submit to God and to enjoy the life that God has given us without constantly insisting we have our own way. To submit to the Lord in the midst of change is to, like I said before, refuse to assert that we're in control. Is to say instead, God, you're in control, and if this is happening, God, I receive it, and I bring it right back to you. Change me. Use me. There's all kinds of ways that you can do this. Somebody's cut you off in traffic, submit. You're like, okay, all right, God. All right, you're using this change. I submit. I submit this thing. Use this. You, call, you, you get a, a call from your child saying they're not doing well and it really discourages you and you hang up the phone you're like, God, I submit this change to you. This is, this is in your ballpark. This is in your court. I can't fix this. I submit to you. When somebody tries to control you or judge you or criticize you, you say, God, whatever way you want me to handle this, I choose to handle it your way, not mine. I submit. I submit. I submit. It's to humble yourself in a situation when you say, not my will, but yours be done. So practice the discipline of submission. Remember, uh, maybe by Tuesday you'll remember a few more things, a few of the things that I've said today. And one of the things I want you to remember is that if a change is happening in your life, whether small or large, God can use that to change you for good and for his glory. I'd like to invite Brittany to come as we uh, as we you know close out as we sing the song uh, I surrender. Uh, but but as we as she does, let's pray together and seek the Lord and uh, and then following the song we'll have communion as well. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this day. I thank you that it's your mighty hand at work in our lives today. I thank you that yours is the glory and the power and the kingdom forever and ever. I thank you that we have your provision in our lives. Father, there's a million things that, are, that have happened in our lives that have come from you, that have blessed us, encouraged us, strengthened us, restored us. And God, in light of all the different ways that you have been faithful, we choose again today to trust you and to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We surrender to you this morning. Change me. Change us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh
invite uh, our deacons. You may sit, have a seat. And invite our deacons to come uh, as we have communion. Um, Jesus taught us that we are to do this in remembrance of him. Remembrance of what he has done. And what not just what he has accomplished, but and what he has offered to us. To change us, to save us. Jesus was betrayed. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'd like to invite Mike to give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice you made on that cross, Lord. That cross that leads to our salvation. Thank you that your son was willing to go. I thank you that he was willing to go for me, for each one here. Father, help us never forget that. Help us to surrender to that. Bless us as we partake of this. We are suffering the Lord's cup as in Jesus' name. Let's take the break together. Eat together and be thankful. same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. I'd like to invite Pastor Jim to give thanks for the blood. Father God, we want to praise you and thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for your precious blood that you shed so that we might have life. We just pray that we might accept your grace completely and turn our lives over to you. We we'll praise you for what you're going to do because of it. In Jesus' name. Let's take the juice and be thankful. Father, we thank you for the life of Jesus given to us. For it is by his life that we live. It is by the blood that you shed for us. That we are forgiven. That we are redeemed. That we are given the promised hope of restoration. That we thank you for the gospel. We proclaim it together today. In Jesus' name. Let us be dismissed with a blessing today. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may be abundant in hope. Go with God today in hope and in surrender in Jesus' name. Amen.